how much money do you make? I love this question. <laughs> I, you know, I actually have to check with my accountant because I brought my salary down. I was making 200K a year and then I brought it down to 125K a year to make room, you know, in the business. And now we're in a good place. So I think she brought me back up to 200K. Oh, wow. But I have to double check. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm happy. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Hannah Williams. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. This is so fun. I've really been looking forward to this. I'm like, let's get into it. With 1.3 million followers on TikTok and over 830,000 on Instagram and features in Forbes, CNBC, Fortune, The Washington Post, Fast Company, and many others, Hannah Williams is nothing short of impressive. After finding out she was being underpaid at her job as a senior data analyst, Hannah became frustrated with the lack of salary transparency and took to the streets with nothing but a microphone and a camera to ask people the audacious question, hey, what do you do and how much do you make? Her content blew up and she founded Salary Transparent Street, a media company that provides people with pay equity resources, including a database, newsletters, and of course, those videos. She's penned long-term deals with massive companies like Indeed and Capital One. And in 2023, her company brought in over $1 million and she was named one of Forbes 30 under 30. I'm exhausted listening to like all that you've accomplished. I'm so obnoxious. (laughs) How do you feel? You know, I'm vibing. It's life is good. Like when you don't prepare for these things and you don't like, it's wild to even think about Forbes 30 under 30. Like I, it just hasn't sunk in yet. I'm just here for a good time. Not a long time. (laughs) I hope you're here for a long time. Let's hope. Yeah, fingers crossed. (laughs) I have more I want to accomplish. (laughs) How does that work? So with Forbes under 30, did they just approach you and they were like, hey, you're on the list? Yeah. So I actually was working with a publicist at the time and he was like, have you thought about Forbes 30 under 30? And I was like, dude, I'm not, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. not even qualified for that. And he's like, no, you're a shoe in Like, I'm going to apply for you. So some people think that you have to buy it. And I think some people do. (laughs) Like, honestly, I do think some people do. And I mean, if you think that buying it is because you pay for a publicist who like handles it for you, then I guess in that sense, you do kind of buy it. But I could have done the application myself. Uh You know, it just it was nice to have somebody do it for me and like push that forward. So before we get started, I do have a preliminary question. Mm -hmm. And if you answer wrong, you do have to leave. Oh, God. (laughs) Okay, I'm scared. You have to go. I have to leave. Okay. Are you ready? Let's hope I get it right. Okay. Okay. It's um, do you know what you're doing? I might have to leave. I have no clue what I'm doing. Like, I'm winging it. You're qualified. (laughs) Okay, I can stay. You passed. Passed. Awesome. None of us know what we're doing. None of us know what we're doing. Look at this girl. She brought in a million dollars last year, Forbes 30 under 30, all these things. No clue. I'm winging it. I really am. Like, that's not an exaggeration. I have no background as a journalist. I have no background in media. I have a management degree. And the only reason I have that is because I would have had to stay an extra semester to get a marketing degree. So, like, (laughs) like, I I, I used to be a consultant. I used to be a data analyst. What am I doing interviewing people (laughs) on the street? But, it, you know, here I am. I just love it. You have the audacity and I'm just here for it. The audacity, um, yep. <laughs> really. Okay, so we're going to do a little rapid fire round just so we can get to know you, Hannah, uh-huh. as an individual outside mm. of your company. So the first question is, where did you grow up? Ooh, good question. Everywhere. My parents were diplomats. My mm. mom is Belgian. My dad is American. They met in Israel at a wedding on a wow. blind date. Blind date at a wedding. That's like... <laughs> I don't know if their friends are good friends or not. It worked out. (laughs) It worked out. Um, They got married. They had me and my sister. And then I grew up traveling the world with them. I was born in Belgium, so I'm Belgian-American. But then I lived in Eritrea, Germany, Croatia, Kuwait, Kazakhstan, and now here. So I've been in six countries. Yeah. So when people are like, where are you from? I'm like... (laughs) I have no clue. You're a third culture kid. I'm a third culture kid. Yeah, you're yeah. from everywhere. Everywhere. And so when you lived in all those different countries growing up, did you go to English-speaking schools? Yeah, I went to international schools. Okay. So it was actually really cool. I went to a British school when I lived in Belgium, so oh. I had a British accent for the <laughs> longest time. And then when we moved to Kazakhstan right after, people thought I was British because I still had the accent. Wow. And I started watching like Hannah Montana and stuff, and I was like trying to break the accent. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I feel like I have like a Southern twang, but I'm not Southern. <laughs> like my dad's from Ohio. I'm from everywhere but it's from Hannah Montana because I was trying to break my accent shout out Miley Cyrus <laughs> shout out Hannah Montana <laughs> oh well that's that's amazing okay so um what did your parent you just said what your parents did for a living yeah my mom was a diplomat and then she became she actually her background was in teaching okay. so she got into like embassy work but her background and most of her career she was a teacher okay. and that's like a lot of my family actually mm-hmm. are 
teachers, like my grandparents, a lot of my family. So I definitely have that teacher influence. You're passionate about education. Absolutely. It's yeah. incredibly important. It was always stressed to me. Like, you know, I was a straight A student and mm-hmm. there was no other option for me. My parents were very strict about education. My dad is a Air Force veteran. Wow. He he has a phenomenal story. Couldn't afford college. Like they raised the price one year on his community college and he had like no other option. So he joined the military, mm-hmm. was in the Air Force for four years, got to travel and went to England with the military, wow. realized he loved travel, okay. got into the um, Department of State, becoming like a diplomat. Okay. And he's done that his whole career. He just yeah. recently retired. He was working in D.C. as like an, part of the inspector general's office. So still traveling to embassies and stuff. Wow. Gosh, he has a cool career. But my mom quit her job fairly early on to take care of me and my sister full time and be kind of like a stay at home mom. Yeah. She had jobs, you know, at the post office and stuff, but she really gave it up to raise us. Wow. Big sacrifice. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Or how does she feel about that? You know, we have our differences about it. Yeah. Part of me is grateful, right? Cause like I am who I am because of her. And like she, you know, even though she gave up her career to be a stay at home mom, she is the most feminist, like hardcore yeah. feminist I know and you can be both I mean you can yeah. be both yeah and it just it made sense for the family but in hindsight I'm like man her career could have possibly been bigger than his yeah. you know and it was a different time you mm-hmm. know he wouldn't have quit his job to the raise woman us is the default yeah yeah I'm, I'm glad things have changed I think a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> I think we're still the default baby in a lot of ways steps, baby <laughs> steps I would not be doing the same as her but yeah. you know I respect her okay wh- did you go to college and if so what did you study yeah I did go to college I actually went to community college I got my associate's degree Ooh. at Northern Virginia Community College in business administration okay. my parents did not give me a choice to go to community college like they were they were like you're not going to a four-year public school we cannot afford it like okay. and you know I'll give some context there my parents saved a hundred thousand dollars for both me and my sister which is a lot of money That's a ton of money goodness gracious it's a lot of money in a five two nine or no it just like set up and it's okay. set up and they were like this is your money for college mm-hmm. if you go over it that's on you if you go under it we give you that money cash when you graduate to like live your life. That's kind of a cool deal. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. Then I started going to college and I was like, college is freaking expensive. I'm expensive. about to blast through this 100K, no problem. Yeah. So they said, if you go to community college, you'll save money. I got a full honor scholarship to go to Nova. So my first two years of college were completely free. Then I made a big mistake and I transferred to Georgetown University, which is a private university. Uh huh. And I blasted through that 100K in like a year. It yeah. It was wild. Like the first minute. Yep. They were just like, <laughs> give me all that money. But yeah. yeah, so I studied management at Georgetown. Okay. Graduated with my bachelor's and I have not been back to college since. <laughs> nice. I'm curious, do you feel like you missed out on that freshman year experience? Yes. And I think that anybody who says they didn't is lying because like it is completely different when you go to community college. You're in college with people like in your class. There's people there that are like 40 years old, 50 years old. They're returning to the workforce, you know. So it's not like, you know, everyone is in the same boat, just graduated, you know, let's go party. And I didn't live on campus. I still lived at home. So I had Mm -hmm. to commute because there were no dorms at a community college. So I definitely did feel like I missed out on like the party culture, but not entirely Mm -hmm. because like, some of my best friends mm-hmm. are from community college that I still talk to to this day. Wow. And we all kind of felt like in the same boat, like, yeah. you know, we don't want to be here. And I think that we just kind of joined forces and we're like, let's have our own fun, you know? Yeah. And so we went out, we had our own little mm-hmm. parties. It was different, but like I missed out. But in hindsight, like, did I really miss out yeah. on a frat party in a basement? Was it worth $50,000? <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. I so love that. I loved my experience at community college more than I enjoyed my my actual college experience at Georgetown, honestly. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I commuted too for a year and a half of college just to, you know, mm-hmm. save money because I, I went to American in D.C. Yeah, so love we, American. We probably lived like a couple miles away from Dude, each we other. we were right next to each other. Yeah. I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I commuted. My parents lived in Silver Spring, so I would oh, commute. Nice like 20 minutes back and forth and I honestly I loved coming home I was like my Mm -hmm. parents have a stocked fridge a fireplace I got my dogs like yeah I'm kind of a homebody so maybe I just liked it but then I also loved living on campus Mm -hmm. you know there's nothing like living on you know a college campus or near campus and so you ended up taking out loans at Georgetown to finish I did I did I ended up taking about 25,000 that's how much I went over Mm -hmm. I lived on campus the first year which is really what ate into my the money my parents saved and then I got an apartment and lived off campus with my my 
now husband, um, my senior year. We love and, James. Yeah, we love James. <laughs> and it was cheaper to live off campus with him than it was to live on campus. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I took out $25,000 in student loans and I paid them off within my first year after graduating. Yeah. Ooh, that's now amazing. Now I look back and I'm like, I shouldn't have done that because like, oh, really? Some, we can get into it. Okay. But let's it get was, into it. it. Yeah. So I wanted to pay off my debt because, first of all, I just like hated having debt. My yeah. parents were always like, Debt is bad. Debt yeah. is terrible. Get uh-huh. rid of it. Kind of Dave Ramsey. Yeah, <laughs> kind of Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Yeah. Different and generation. Yeah, so my parents were like, you have to get rid of this. Like, you have to pay it off. And I made it just like my ultimate goal to pay that off. And I did because I like got sign-on bonuses at jobs when I moved mm-hmm. and I put that all on the loan. But now I look back and I'm like, you know, not all debt is bad. Yeah. And I did not have, like my parents didn't help me build up my credit score. I didn't have a credit card because they were like, you know, debt is bad. bad. Credit cards are bad. Yeah. I didn't even have a credit card. So I had no credit really when I graduated. And then I realized having debt helps you build credit. Mm. And, you know, also it would have been nice to have that $25,000 at that point in my life. You know, like I was living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And I did that to myself because I was like, I have to pay off this debt. No debt. Yeah. What now I'm like, I didn't rate? have to rush. I rush. Uh-huh. Do you remember your interest rate on your debt? It was like 13%. Oh, it was really high. So it, it was, was a private loan? It was incredibly high. So like, yeah, it was a private loan. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't even qualify for public or anything because my parents made it too much. You're like which in was between. frustrating because they were a one income household. Like my mom didn't make any money. Yeah. And my dad, you know, was well off, but he mm-hmm. was only making like 150K, which in the DC area, you know, is not insane. No. And so like we didn't even qualify for public loans or it's, any type yeah. of financial aid. It was wild I got a ton yeah. of I got a ton of scholarships though I will say I was a Taco Bell live mouse scholar no <laughs> dude I had the Taco Bell scholarship <laughs> no way yeah they gave me like $35,000 it was serious? amazing yeah shout out Taco Bell shout out Bell. Taco Bell <laughs> okay live mouse fun fact I've never had Taco Bell Aaron ever in my life we're about to go to Taco Bell. Like literally. Can we go to the cantina one where the, you yes, get margaritas? Yes, that is the best <laughs> one because you get the alcohol. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm about to change your life. I love Taco Bell so much. Uh, what was your first job ever? Pizza Hut. I made like six bucks an hour in Colorado at Pizza Hut. You and your Taco Bell Pizza Hut. You oh were yeah. Like a fast food junkie. Fast food. I, I had a that. ton of jobs. So many part-time jobs. I liked working at Pizza Hut though, but you smelled so bad oh. after your shift. It yeah. was terrible. And then what? what is your current job? My current job, I guess I'm a full-time content creator, social activist, mm-hmm. influencer, some might say. Um, but really I'm just like, the CEO of my media company, Salary Transparent Street. Yeah. I interview people on the street, asking them what they do for a living and how much they make. And <laughs> somehow people pay me for that. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's I amazing. <laughs> um, and do you like your current job? I love my current job. Mm-hmm. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. There's no other job that I would happily work 60 hours a week for. <laughs> Is that how much you work 60 hours? I would, I would <laughs> estimate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always like, well, if I'm dreaming and, and dreaming about work, does that does count? Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Then I might be at like 65. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My last question. I don't mm-hmm. ask everybody this, but I Ooh. have to ask you, mm-hmm. how much money do you make? I love this question. <laughs> I, you know, I actually have to check with my accountant because I brought my salary down. I was making 200K a year and then I brought it down to 125K a year to make room, you know, in the business I you know I'm not the type that's like yeah if I'm making 100k I'm happy you know so I'm not like worried about that and I wanted to make room in the business to like hire and just you know not be so stressed and now we're in a good place so I think she brought me back up to 200k oh but I have to double check yeah that's great I'm I'm happy I love how you just say exactly you're so transparent you're the most transparent person I know (laughs) it's hard to tell it as it is and like you want to be the people pleaser you don't want to offend anybody Mm -hmm. but what I found is like direct transparency is respect Yes. You know, and, and there's that balance between being nice and a people pleaser and then showing people that you respect them. And there's yeah. ways that you can deliver that information without, you know, making people feel offended. But yeah. it is hard. Like, yeah. I still struggle with that, too. I'm a people pleaser as well. Yeah. I struggle with it, too. Yeah. I love Brene Brown. She was his clearest Brene, kind. Brene. Hero. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. I just, I love her communication advice because I feel like it's catered towards women. Yes. And a lot of the books I read are written by men and they have great advice. But mm-hmm. I just, I feel like there's just you got to treat women differently. Anyway, yeah. this is a typical tangent for me. I need to get back to the <laughs> We're like 30 minutes in. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, we're getting to it now. Okay, so you told us about your college experience. Uh, tell us about graduation and getting that first job as a oh, telemarketer. God. <laughs> <laughs> this was a dark point in my life, Erin. <laughs> so I went to Georgetown, which, you know, depends on who you ask. I would argue is a very good school. Very, very well-known. Very prestigious. 
didn't feel that prestigious on my way out because I chose to go to Georgetown because I felt like it was a guaranteed way to get a job. You know, like yeah. I was worried about when I graduate, I, you know, I have a community college degree. I need to make sure that I have that school that matters. And my advice to anyone listening is F that because really? <laughs> it didn't help me. I was one of the few graduating seniors a month before graduation that had no job lined up. Wow. And I went to the business school there and basically everybody that goes to Georgetown business, and I didn't know this ahead of time, which would have helped me before transferring. If you go to business school at Georgetown, mm -hmm. you're going into finance or you're going into management consulting. Okay. I wanted to do neither of those things. I like, wanted no nothing to do with for, them. Not doing it. Nope. <laughs> stay far away from me. So all the people that they had on campus, you know, to find jobs, all the recruiters and stuff were not catered to my interests. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, I'm not going to blame them. There were a lot of things I could have done that I didn't, but it was really stressful to be like the one, what it felt like the one student who was like, I don't have a job. Like, yeah. what am I going to do? Graduations in a month. So I just started applying to a ton of things that I didn't even want to do, including mm -hmm. a telemarketing job, which was in Arlington, right across the bridge from Georgetown. I went in for an interview. They made me an offer on the spot, which probably should have been a red flag. <laughs> um, $40,000, which in the Arlington area, I was very much penny pinching, yeah. you know, paycheck to paycheck. Started, I graduated on a Saturday. I started on Monday, oh which hurt gosh. even more because a lot of the kids I went to school with at Georgetown came from rich families. Yeah. So they all went to Europe for the summer. You oh, know, they, they all went. You're to, not going to Ibiza? No, girl, I'm going to work. How are you not going to Ibiza? <laughs> it's like a I had no break. I immediately went to work and it sucked. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. It was the worst. I was full on cold calling people, oh trying gosh. to sell them LexisNexis legal software. No. It sucked. And, but you know what? I look back on it and yeah. I'm like, it taught me yes. so much. So much. I feel like so everybody much. needs to learn how to sell at one yes. point in their life. I would almost recommend that everybody have a sales job yeah. for like two months. Cause that's how long I lasted. <laughs> <laughs> I cried every day. I was so desperate. I would have done anything to get out. Yeah. Several times I was like, I'm going to quit with no backup plan. Like I'm yeah. just going to be unemployed. But I know how to sell. I know how to cold call. I know yeah. how to be put on the spot. I know how to have a conversation with somebody, yeah. you know, over the phone about uh -huh. something I don't want to talk about. It definitely, for from someone who's like, honestly introverted and shy a lot of people would not guess that but I am yeah it taught me so much about people skills mm -hmm. and how to basically just get to the point yeah I love that so much uh so then you hopped over to a few data science roles data analysts oh, sorry yeah, data yeah. analysts kind of the same thing okay. I don't know <laughs> okay and uh and then you job hopped mm -hmm. four jobs in four years five jobs in two and a half years oh my gosh I was so off five yep. jobs in two and a half years two and a half years how <laughs> yeah. did you do that? So it basically was just sort of like, so I, I had the telemarketing job. That was my first job. Mm -hmm. I was there two months. I got a really cool opportunity to work at a small government contracting firm mm -hmm. who they didn't know what they needed, but they basically were hiring a junior data analyst, which ended up being, I think my long title was a functional data management analyst, like something really long. <laughs> and so they basically, yeah, they just needed somebody to organize their Excel files. Mm -hmm. So they actually found me on Georgetown's career network, you know, okay. the Hoya Sex. So shout out Georgetown yeah. for that, I guess. And I qualified for a secret clearance because, you know, I had a great background my mm. dad had a you know ts so you know i have no no skeletons in my closet yeah that was really the end for me when i got the secret clearance they sponsored it for me which mm. i know a lot of people will ask well how do you do that i have no clue mm. they were just like can you qualify and i was like yeah. yeah and they're like okay we'll sponsor it for you okay that's all i know um <laughs> so i got that job and that was my break into government contracting and okay. data analysis work then i was there for a couple months and i started getting a lot of recruiters in my linkedin because yeah. in the area like at the time what was this like 2019 2020 yeah. data analysis was really starting to take off Absolutely. and it hadn't been too you know it wasn't too popular yet yeah. so there were people that were like willing to hire these data analysts for huge amounts of money and they were reaching out to me offering me like 70k 80k wow. and I was I was happy with my job but yeah. like I knew I didn't want to stay there long term it just wasn't like the right fit for me and did you study this in school how'd you get the no. skill um they basically were like because I had a management degree yeah so they were like 
you know, what kind of skills do you bring to the table? And so I really stressed the class projects I did because okay. in Georgetown, I did an open class, which was like operation information management, okay. basically like strategy, business strategy. Mm -hmm. And we did a bunch of case projects that involved Excel work, you know, okay. deep dive analysis. And so I was just like, I have a management degree, but I have all this experience. Yeah. And I just, in my interview, that was all I talked about was those case projects. Okay, good and to know. I guess that helped. I'm a very good interviewer. Okay. I will stress that. And <laughs> an interview. You, An interviewee. You know, <laughs> in a job interview, I've just learned how to sell myself really well. Okay, and I think that that is yeah. essential for a successful career. You yep. have to know how to sell yourself. It's a skill. So it's a mm -hmm. skill. Yeah. And you can only get better at it by doing more interviews. So the best advice I have actually ever got about business and like careers was from my dad. Mm -hmm. And he told me, there's no such thing as a bad interview. Even if you think you flubbed it, mm -hmm. even if you're not inter interested mm -hmm. in the job, take the interview great advice yes because it's, it's a muscle and every time you exercise yes. I always tell people every interview gets easier mm -hmm. like if when you're yep. in your 40s and you're interviewing it's a piece of cake piece of cake you know what you're doing the hardest interview you're going to have is like that one out of college yeah you're going to be like I don't know who I am and I don't know what I don't I'm, know what I'm doing what yeah. are these questions um, I'm doing, oh, I still don't know what I'm doing so you job hopped your way up mm -hmm. to tell me about the last job that you had before yeah so before. I job hopped a couple times like five times two and a half years I went through these jobs they just kept offering me more money I would go to my boss and be like, hey, these companies are you trying to coach me. Yeah. And they would raise my salary. But then eventually, like, I was still getting more money. So I would quit. And I moved around. And I just kept telling people, you know, I'm looking for opportunities that inspire me. And that was 100% true. Like, yeah. I just kept getting really cool opportunities. And towards the end of my time in consulting, I found out I was underpaid, like $25,000 mm. at my third job, fourth job total mm. as a senior data analyst left that job making $25,000 more. So I validated that I was underpaid at my most current job before doing this as another senior data analyst. And I was supporting a government contract for veterans. Um, it was really cool. Like I was basically reading exit surveys from veterans and, cool. you know, talking about what they were, you know, worried about transitioning into civilian yeah. life. Cool. And like, I was just basically gleaning insights from these surveys and telling them about it. And then I started my TikTok and then I quit. The rest is history. The rest is history. So do you think that you were able to so successfully job hop because you had an in-demand skill? Part of that, yes. But I think it was also that in our industry, when you're interviewing, people can be very like, bland like government mm. contracting is a very boring <laughs> yeah. career you know we yeah. work for the government and ugh, you're like yeah. a little like ray of sunshine walking in there <laughs> honestly though and I yeah. think that that attitude and that perspective especially being young I was like I want to change things yeah. I want to have an impact mm -hmm. I think that was refreshing to them and I really do think it helped me in my interviews you know yeah. just bringing that energy mm -hmm. but definitely it was part of my skill set and I was constantly improving my skill set. I would talk to other data analysts. I'm like, mm -hmm. what are you working on? What are you building on? What course are you taking? Oh, so you're just teaching your, you're yes. taking courses. And, and I would talk to my manager over there and I'd be like, what do you need me to learn? Can I take this course? Will you pay for very it? Very proactive. Very proactive. You, I was yeah. on top of it. I'm, I'm very type A, very obnoxiously on top of it. So you were not quite quitting then. No, I you was were not. Opposite. I was very loud quitting. You were I, like loud quitting, but you were also being a stellar employee. Yes. And I think that's why I, I felt I had the balls to loud quit because yeah. I was like, I'm valuable. When I found out I was underpaid, I told them like, this is exactly how much money I need to make to be fairly compensated. I showed them the jobs I were hiring for that. And then I also brought to the table, this is the impact I've had on the contract. Yeah. And what was wild to me was in government contracting, you're mm -hmm. a contractor, but you work with actual feds yeah. and they are basically, you cater to them. Yeah. So I was working directly with the federal, you know, lead on that was leading this contract. She loved me like, yeah. and I was brand new and she was like, we need you. You need to stay. You're important. Like, yeah. and she would tell me this all the time. So I would tell them I'm valuable. You cannot lose me. Yeah. They did not care. And when I put in my two weeks, do you know what they said? What? Name your price. And I told them I already did. And I left. Ooh, yep. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. The no audacity. <laughs> um, when you found out that you were being underpaid, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. Where do I start? 
Dark times. Um, I was kind of at a point in my career where I liked what I was doing, but I wasn't really sure what the future was either. So I think that that kind of helped me, you know, move forward and Mm -hmm. try to find a way out of the darkness. But it was really stressful. Like, it sucks to be underpaid. It's basically the best way to feel disrespected, Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you're bringing value to your work, which I knew I was. So it was really disheartening. I was incredibly depressed. Mm -hmm. I started writing an outline. I was like, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to call it my midlife crisis, like my my quarter (laughs) Quarter life life crisis. crisis. Because I was 25 at the time. And I was like, I'm going through my quarter life crisis. Like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I was going to quit my job with no backup plan. It was really hard. And it took several months to get out of that situation. So like, I would tell people if you are in that point in your career where you're like stuck or you don't know what to do next, what goes down always comes back up. Mm. That has been true in my entire life, not just my career. There's always a rainbow after the rain. It's Mm -hmm. so, ugh, it's so cringy. I know, but it's it's true. It's so true. And you'll not, you'll, you won't always be in that dark spot. Yeah. And I think that like knowing that there was something at the end of that gave me the courage to keep trying to find it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was a months long process. My husband, James was incredibly supportive. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that having support in your life, mm-hmm. especially with your family and people that are close to you can take you so many places. Oh yeah. It's essential to happiness. Absolutely. I, I yeah, I interviewed a, a friendship expert and we were talking about mm. the science behind relationships and how important it is to surround yourself with people who support you quality of your friends like you say like your dad gave you this great career advice my dad gave me great career advice just having like a a mentor somebody to just give you give you those little pieces of advice the nuggets (laughs) um so if there's anybody out there who's like i kind of want to see if i'm underpaid what would you recommend they do yeah market research first and foremost if you have a colleague in your company who is in a similar role or a direct role you know someone that's doing something similar that's the first person you should talk to and approaching that conversation i would stress do it off company time and off company property. Mm. We are still in the age where some companies do not like people talking about their pay, even if it is your legal protected right under the National Labor Relations Act. Which you're not sure if you are protected, (laughs) Google it. Um, But yeah, just do the market research. Talk to your colleagues. That is the first place to find out whether or not you are being fairly compensated because Mm -hmm. if they're in a similar role, they should be making the same as you. If they aren't, try to figure out why those differences occur. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people make different amounts in the same role because they bring something different to the table. Bring more value. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's important to try to do the investigation work and figure out what that is. And then the internet, of mm-hmm. course. Go six pages deep in Google. That's what I did. Mm. There's so many resources out there, not just Indeed, not just Glassdoor. People have created actual databases for industries. Oh, like Salary Transparency. Like Salary Transparency. (laughs) We have a salary database. Thank you so much for the Wow, I'm just plugging away. (laughs) I swear. (laughs) So you can check our database there. It is completely open. It's an independent database as well. So if you go to like Indeed, I actually built the database because I was frustrated by the major products that were out there. Yeah. Because if you search in Glassdoor, ZipRecruiter, you know, those those type of places, what the salaries are for a data analyst, for example, it gives you back an average yeah. off their aggregated data, thousands of rows of data. And the whole country, right? And the whole country. Which in New York, it's going to be different than Indianapolis. Exactly. Yeah. And those are such important factors to be aware of. Your location, your years of experience, your education, your direct and indirect years of experience. There's so much that goes into that. So our independent database is actually, if you search a job title, it shows you every single response per person, including the context that's missing. So you can see what job they work at, like the company, years of experience, education, location, all of that. And that will help you actually compare yourself and figure out whether you're in that range of being fairly compensated. And also you have to contribute to these databases. Like don't just consume, like before you get in, like input your stuff, you know, it's important. Please, no. I love that. Please (laughs) submit your data because data, I'm a data analyst and that's why I did it. Like I know data is powerful and the more data, the better. Yeah. So you're like, Damn it, I'm going to go out with my microphone and I'm going to ask That's people spot on. <laughs> the most taboo question yeah. you can imagine, which is how much money do you make? Mm-hmm. Which people just, you know, so much align with their value and their worth. And it's just yeah. such a personal question. Who was the first person that you asked? I think it was some young boy, um, not boy, a young <laughs> a <child>. man, <laughs> a child. Um, it was a young man and I'm pretty sure he was 
I remember like everybody in their job title and I'm pretty sure he was a cyber analyst or a data scientist it's in something DC. like that in DC mm -hmm. in Georgetown actually mm -hmm. um we went out on like a Saturday I brought my husband I was like please like I, I know it's a weekend but like, I need to avenge <laughs> he was like what are you doing like what is the point of this and I was like no this is important like let's go see you what do. happens I, I knew that it was important I didn't think it would have the impact it had. I literally was like, 100 people are going to see this and think if that it's valuable and I won't have to do it again. <laughs> Chokes on me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. Posted that first video, went viral overnight. But yeah, I mean, props to all the people that answered. Like, I wouldn't have a channel or platform without the people who also value transparency yeah. and are brave enough to come share it on our channel. Like, they're the heroes. Absolutely. Um, do you think that some people inflate their salaries when they tell you? Great question. I actually don't. I think that there's probably a good 5% that okay. have, you know, inflated. Um, and I, I can almost always tell, and they usually are the same job. And I don't think that it's them like sales. inflating <laughs> sales. Um, it's usually the jobs where it's like, they don't know how much they make. Yeah. You know, it's they, like a can, bonus they can commission. make like sales, like commission. Mm -hmm. Like if, if they're like, yeah, I make like 200K. I'm like, well, what's your base salary? Yeah. And how much of that is commission? I love it when you break that down because like their base salary can be 50,000, mm -hmm. but you know, their commission could be a hundred, you know. Exactly. So you don't know. Like sales, uh, business owners. Like sometimes I'll be like, how much do you make? And I feel like they give me their business, business revenue, revenue instead of how much they pay themselves, which like, I mean, technically I guess that is your money, but like, did yeah. you you pocket it yeah. like that's a lot of money in taxes yeah <laughs> I hope the IRS isn't watching <laughs> um but yeah no I think that the majority of the time people are truthful or they try to be as truthful as possible yeah. um a lot of people nowadays recognize us so when we do the interviews like they've seen it they know that their <laughs> colleagues are gonna see it they know their family's gonna yeah. see it it doesn't behoove them to lie like it's just gonna cause problems, problems yeah. I do know sometimes when I feel like people have lied they're the ones that ask me to take the video down and I'm like mm-hmm that's oh, why. So you've had a few people ask mm -hmm. you to take the video down. That's been a struggle, actually. Like, yeah. a lot of people will be like, we'll tell it. them, you know, like, this is our contact it's information. It's going to go viral. You've signed this form, you know, a release form. Like, tell me within 24 hours if you don't want it up. And then they'll be like, a week later after it's been up for three days, they'll be like, um, my friends and family have seen this. Can you take it down? I'm like, come on, bro. You knew what you were signing up for. You knew what you were for. doing. Yeah. And you tell them, like, we're very big. Every yes. video goes viral. At this point, yeah. Do you block people? Hell yeah. <laughs> Dude, I block every day. And I've gotten crap about that before where people are like, this is freedom of speech. Yeah. You know, you can't censor. And it's like, this is my channel. Yeah. I read all the comments. I have to put up with this every day. Yeah. If you come at me in the wrong way, mm -hmm. I will block you and I won't feel sorry about it. Yeah, it's funny. I don't do a lot of blocking unless I feel like the person's creepy. Yeah. Or I'm like, Ugh. I feel like you've got good, like, yeah. the people that follow you. It's pretty good vibes. It's good vibes. <laughs> I, my community brings sometimes different vibes. <laughs> well, also like you're talking about something that I think a lot of people are insecure about. Yeah. How much money do you make? A lot of people feel underpaid or they have regrets about their career. So it's, it's touchy. So it's taboo. Absolutely. It's taboo. It's still taboo. My videos are all very wholesome, good vibes, but I do every now and then just have somebody who comments like the weirdest. I have this one guy who like monitors my roots and my hair. Ew. And he's like, Aaron, like it's time to dye your roots. And I'm like, okay, you're getting blocked today. Like yeah. that is the last time we were talking about my roots. <laughs> That's the other thing is like, you know, I did this to bring transparency, not to have my image oh. demolished. And that is what makes being on the internet difficult. So hard because I didn't sign up for that, no. you know, and like I've, I, yeah, we can go on a tangent being about a girl, that. and I'm like, Even I had to worse. put makeup on so that people don't tell me I look tired in my videos. <laughs> I had several people DM me with Botox recommendations, Dude, so rude, and I'm you like, don't need it. I, I well, no one needs it. No one needs if it. If it makes you feel good, go for it. But like, you're beautiful either way. And I'm like, I am talking about 401ks. I'm mm -hmm. not even like a, fit, a fashion influencer. I'm not even a beauty influencer. No. Yeah. yeah. And if I was, maybe. But like, I'm I'm not talking about that mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Another tangent. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about monetizing. So you went yeah. from making one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year to salaried nine to five. Yeah. To making a million dollars in your business. I did not pocket it, but okay. my business made a million. Exactly. Yes. Your business made a million. You paid yourself $200,000 yeah. in salary, which is still a huge bump. Huge You're bump. 27? 27. Insane. 
Thanks. Like literally, it's crazy. So let's talk about the breakdown of where, how'd you make yeah. your money? Mm-hmm. 97% of that is brand partnerships, all, over a million. So it's basically like 30,000 is the rest. O- like wow. almost entirely all of it was brand partnerships. Okay. And a lot of that comes from long-term brand partnerships. Like our big players are Indeed and Capital One. Yeah. They have really, we're married to them is how I view it. And that was always my goal. I didn't want to be the person who has a different ad with a different company every week. Yeah. I am a consumer consumer, a voracious consumer of content. I love content. I love the internet. Yeah. I have my favorite, you know, influencers. You were one of them <gasps> and now we're peers. And I think that's so cool. So um, but I, I, you know, I consume content and I hate when people I follow, creators that I like are just working with, because you can tell when yeah. they just did mm-hmm. the partnership for the check and I'm yeah. not knocking it. Mm-hmm. I get it. We all have to pay our bills, but I always wanted to approach it from yeah. These are the brands I want to work with because they directly align with my mission and my yeah. values. Mm-hmm. And I want to work with them long term so that I don't have to work with these other one offs. Uh-huh. So when I approached, when I came to the table with Indeed and Capital One, I was like, it is in your best interest to be married to us, long-term. you know, long term. Yeah. And they agreed, you know, it was it was a match made in heaven. Yeah. Um, so those were really lucrative partnerships. I can't disclose like legally, yeah, which course. is frustrating. I did fight them on that. I was yeah. like, you know, Come I on, talk guys. about, yeah. And people are asking like how much, you know, did, did indeed pay you? And yeah. I wish I could say it. What I can say is that our market rate for our content hovers around $15,000 per paid ad. Okay. So if you want to do the math, you know, one or two of those a month, yeah. including, you know, newsletter ads, mm-hmm. YouTube ads, yeah. what have you, um, it adds up and it's Gosh. quite lucrative. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about these salary transparency laws. So I have now in the state of California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland, Nevada, New York, Rhode Island, Washington, and then select cities, you know, mm-hmm. like New York City, companies are required to post a salary range in the job description. Yeah. This is a new thing. Mm-hmm. When I graduated from college, it was very much, first of all, taboo to talk about money in mm-hmm. like the first interview. And also, you it was opaque. You had yeah. no idea what the company... So I remember in 2021, I posted a TikTok where I did like a skit back and forth and a person asked, what's your salary expectations? Love that. And I was like, what's your budget? Uh And like that video went crazy viral because it's almost like it clicked. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wait, they have a budget because as a freelancer, when people post jobs for freelancers, they always post like we're looking for a video editor, weekly rate, $4,000. Like that is always what it is. Mm -hmm. And when I was working in like more W-2 roles, I was like, wait, why don't they do that for full-time right. jobs? It just seemed really weird to me. So I just made a TikTok to like reflect that. Mm-hmm. And you at the same time started creating content. And there yeah. were other content creators who started making content kind of encouraging us to just... It all happened sort of at the same time. Same time. Mm-hmm. Just politely ask, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm flexible. What's your budget? Because yeah. you know they have a budget. You know they have a budget. They always have a budget even mm-hmm. me and you when we're hiring just I know how much I can afford so you can you can discuss salary yes. with your coworkers yeah if you are protected under the National Labor Relations Act which is like almost every single private employer unless you are a federal employee which mm-hmm. you already have pay transparency anyway. they had it before all of us did so it's not a problem or uh, you work on a railroad or a farm so random. You, so <laughs> random unless you are part of those three groups You are protected, most likely, under the National Labor Relations Act, which protects your right to talk about pay with anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. That should not be, and and I'll also stress, because some people are like, well, my company had me sign an NDA. B.S., that NDA it hold up in court. is not, a, yeah, it's not enforceable in court. It will not stand. And if you get fired for talking about your pay, great yeah. lawsuit. Also, this is America. There are so many employment lawyers chomping at the bit to mm-hmm. like read. And so many people think, oh, well, I can't contact a lawyer because I can't afford them. Mm-hmm. First of all, just contact them. Yeah. And a lot of them, if they see that there's a case, they could even take it and mm-hmm. not charge you unless they win. Yeah. So and a lot of them like won't charge you for that 30 minute call. Mm-hmm. They'll just hear if you, have, if a you case. have a case. And if you have a case, they'll tell you and you can decide from there. Yeah. But like if you feel like you were unfairly let mm-hmm. go, you know, illegally let go, Yeah, you should check. You should talk with a labor lawyer to make sure because lawsuits can be lucrative and they will settle with you and yeah. it'll be worth it. <laughs> yeah. And as business owners, you know, there was, that's why HR exists. It's because yep. you're trying to protect. I mean, HR exists for a lot of different reasons, but mm-hmm. one of the things is to legally protect companies yeah. from incoming lawsuits. America really is the wild, wild west. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. And this industry is too, like the creator economy. Oh, yeah. It's, it's wild. We're all figuring it out as we go along. No and one knows what they're doing. <gasps> 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's almost like the wow. name of the show. Wow. It's almost the name of the show. Wow. <laughs> I'm so flattered. Um, okay. I want to get into some other hot topics. So mm-hmm. Forbes reported that a failure to negotiate your first offer can lead to a difference mm-hmm. of $1 million in lifetime earnings, yeah. which is insane. A lot of people message me and they're like, oh, you know, I can't negotiate. It's my first job. Mm, no. Can you can you tell us about why you should negotiate your first job and how to go about it? Yeah, you should always negotiate. First job, last job, middle job, I don't care. <laughs> Any job, negotiate. And the best way to do that is to come prepared with market research. Know what you want to be paid before you go into the job interview. And then ask for a little more. And then add, and then <laughs> add tax, right? And then add tax. I love that little, you know, <laughs> add a little 10%, add a little 20%. Because... Yeah. People are so scared that, you know, the job offer is going to be rescinded. They're going to make an enemy. No. The worst thing that you're going to get is they're going to say, we can't afford that, but here's what we can afford. Yeah. And if you negotiate and you start at that high end of your range that you're expecting, you can negotiate and still end up higher than what they offered you versus if you start at the lower end or Mm -hmm. in the middle. So always negotiate. Come prepared with that range that you're expecting. There should be a range of, if it's an annual salary, start from a minimum to max range of like Mm $20,000. If it's an hourly rate, Mm -hmm. try to add, you know, five to $10 extra to that hourly rate that they're giving you. But make sure that you're also asking for something that's fair, that's backed up by your market research that other people are asking for as well and being compensated. Just come prepared. It'll help you confidently ask for what you know you, you should be paid because everybody else is making it. Yeah. And it'll also help you spot a really low ball offer, yeah. which is a great red flag to run. Absolutely. I know people are always like, I did this and I got the offer rescinded. And I was like, first of all, it's extremely rare. Extremely rare. And it's never a you thing. It's if a them the job thing. offer is rescinded, it's a them thing. And it's not somewhere you'd want to work because if Correct. they're not even willing to negotiate, negotiate do you want to work there you do not want to work there but with a first job offer I think a lot of people go in and they're like I feel like I don't have any reason to negotiate Mm. but what I say is you know they offered you the job yeah not this other guy yeah they Um, see value in you they see value in you and they're expecting you to negotiate at least in the United States everyone is expecting you to counter yeah recruiters are always expecting you to negotiate if you Mm -hmm. don't Honestly, if you if you accept the first offer they give you, you're leaving money on the table. Absolutely. That is basically what they're saying. We'll start here. Yeah. That number is the starting point. Mm-hmm. You should negotiate always. And it's that snowball effect mm-hmm. because your last job is going to go off, you know, that job and then it's just going to keep going up. Yeah. So absolutely negotiate your first job offer. And I think something else that's really important is that people will message me and say, I used your salary negotiation script and mm-hmm. it didn't work. And I'm like, guys, delivery is important. Delivery. You can't walk in there all pompous yeah. and prideful. You need to go in with some humility but confidence. Yeah. And negotiation also isn't always about that salary or the you know hourly rate. If they can't meet you at that, what you're asking for, there's other things you can negotiate. Absolutely. If you're going into the office, commuting costs parking, yep. anything, gas, whatever mm-hmm. it costs you to get to the office is something that you should negotiate. Yeah. You can also negotiate your 401k match, PTO, healthcare, yeah. PTO, holidays. There's pet insurance, <laughs> yeah. childcare, severance, severance. <laughs> Everything is negotiable. Yeah. It's all made up, especially in the it's private sector. It's all made up. <laughs> yeah, honestly. I know. I'll, I'll, uh, I was talking to somebody who's like, you know, an expert in HR, and they were talking about, you know, all the math that goes into compensation. Yeah. And I was like, I, I get that you have all these softwares and stuff that tells mm-hmm. you. At the end of the day, though, companies can pay you whatever they want to. Yeah. So it's really just up to some guy in finance at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and, but I know it's a careful balance. You know, we don't want to see like wage inflation to the, to the point where right. it's just crazy. But, but it should be fair. It should, it should be, be competitive. Fair. Exactly. It should be fair. I wanted to ask you about like kind of these phrases, you know, we're hearing like quiet quitting, lazy girl job, like automate your job, like your job isn't mm-hmm. your life. What do you think about that? Like, do you think that people can have a dream job or they should like their job? Yeah, I love the phrases like that every month there's a new one and like yeah. CNBC and they always lose their minds. They over lose the, their minds. They lose their minds. They're like, what is Gen Z doing? I know. Um, I love it. I think it's nice to see them kind of scrambling. Honestly, <laughs> it's, it's nice to feel like we there have we some power this. back. Like there really is yeah. more of a power balance happening. Yeah. Um, but I think at the end of the day, people are just seeking joy and fulfillment mm-hmm. and balance, you know, and, and I don't think that, everybody has a dream job. Mm -hmm. I'm incredibly lucky and privileged to have 
found my dream job without even looking for it. Yeah. I did not apply to this job. I created it you out of thin air. You can just make it up, y'all. I made up my <laughs> job. I asked people on the street what they do for a living and how much they make. If you can find that on Indeed, send it to me <laughs> because I want to make sure I'm competitively compensated. Um, but yeah, I mean... A lot of times I feel like dream jobs, if people say they have their dream job, it is that situation where they made, they made it, it themselves up. because they know what they were looking for. Yeah. If you are trying to find a dream job that fits the parameters of somebody else, mm. it's going to be hard to fit yeah. because circles don't fit in squares. Squares don't fit in circles. You yeah. know, it's it's always, well, actually, a circle does fit in a square. Well, it, theoretically, depending on the size. Theoretically, <laughs> depending on the size. Um, but yeah, I mean... I think that we give her, we put too much pressure on ourselves to have the perfect job or yeah. the dream job. I spent the first two, three years of my career in five jobs. Not a single one of them was my <laughs> dream job, but I was constantly seeking it. Yeah. Like I didn't give up on myself. Yeah. I knew that I wanted to have something that brought me joy and fulfillment. I had no idea what yeah. that was. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us don't. Yeah. And we put too much pressure on ourselves to know. Yeah. You won't know until you're there. Yeah. So just you know, follow the breadcrumbs. I love that. Go in the directions that bring you joy. Yeah. Even if they don't feel like they're what you, was written for you, even yeah. if they don't match your degree, mm -hmm. just have the courage to figure it out. Yeah. And I think I was thinking about this last night, just like hope and dream. Hope. I think that our generation and Gen Z's as well, because of so many external factors have kind of been beaten down and don't dream anymore. Yeah. It's like, guys, you, you can have a really fun job. Hannah walks around on the street with a camera and gets paid. Her business brought in a million dollars. Like she's making six figures. Like mm -hmm. you dream of a, a beautiful job and you can find it. Um, dream big. But also like, I think your twenties, you're just not going to have your favorite job in your twenties. No, most of the, most of us won't. And yeah. that's the reality of it. You like, gotta get messy and yeah, you gotta make you gotta mistakes and put the, what is it? Pound the pavement for a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, you'll figure it out. Yeah. But, like, if you're not in your dream job, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. I would yeah. say probably 95% of people in the world are not in their dream job. And that is okay. It's fine. Having yeah. your dream job is, like, one of those really hard things to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You can still enjoy your job because yeah. it pays the bills. And any job is going to have pros and cons. Like, me and you have these ideal careers where we work for ourselves. I have so many cons. I could talk cons all day. Yeah, but there's <laughs> That still, you don't like, know. The, yeah, you don't even know until you get it. Like, I, my dream, you know, I work in the film industry. My dream was to do this one thing. And then I did it. And I was like this kind of sucks. It's not like, what I thought it I'm was. I'm waking up at 4 a.m. I like don't have any control over my life. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes your dream job, you'll get it and you'll realize, oh, it's actually not. Yeah. When I was in college, ideal. I spent like the first three years of my college career interning exclusively with sports teams. Like really? the Redskins, now the Commanders. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, the Nats, the Wizards. You know, I was, I was dead set on working in the sports industry. That yeah. was what I thought I wanted to do. That was uh -huh. my dream job. And I realized pretty quickly, like, it actually was not my dream job because mm. I love sports, but I also like being home on Friday nights yeah. and on the weekend. <laughs> I, I learned very quickly yeah. that if you work in sports, that is not the work-life balance that you will have. Also, yeah. the pay sucks. Sucks. <laughs> sucks so bad. All my internships oh, were yeah. unpaid, and, and I got paid in pizza, like, literally. That's where my anti-pizza party, like... <laughs> My anger yeah, comes from because I've had ready. so much Papa John's that was my payment for working Gosh. six, seven hours. So that's it's like that in the film industry. And I realized with content creation, I was like, OK, maybe I do want to make more money. Yeah. <laughs> Making money is really fun. The film industry, obviously, I'm very passionate about filmmaking and I love documentary filmmaking and journalism. And I get to do content creation now, which, you know, is more lucrative. It blends. You know, you can just, you can do both. Exactly. Like, you're still utilizing the same skill sets, but mm -hmm. in a different way, in a job you created. Yeah. Like, that's where I think the beauty is. If you love what you do, but you don't love where you're at, yeah. where can you do what you do somewhere else? Ooh, I love or that. Or for yourself. <laughs> I love that. Um, wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight. Um, yeah, I mean, we've both found ourselves in unexpected internet careers. Yeah. Neither <laughs> we of us were trying to be influencers. This. I just like to make little videos and yeah. you like making little videos and asking people how much mm -hmm. money they make. What is a piece of advice that you're glad you ignored? Yeah. The number one piece of advice that I'm really glad I ignored was people telling me to stay at a job at least a year before I even considered quitting. Mm -hmm. I left my first job out of college two months two into months. the job. <laughs> and if I had stayed a year my life would be so different right now yeah. in, I think, a negative way. I knew that job was not right for me. I cried every day. 
I hated it. I knew it in my gut. I knew it in my soul. If I stayed another day, I would have been doing myself a disservice. Yeah. And I think so many people get hung up on, well, it's going to look bad on my resume. It's going to look bad on my resume. You don't have to put it on your resume. Mm -hmm. If you were only there a couple months, yeah. you do not have to list that job on your resume. Yeah. And if you do and they ask you why you left, hopefully you have a good reason. Yeah. This does not make me passionate. It's not relevant to my skill set. I don't want to do it. Like, it's you know that what I simple. love saying? I'm intentional about my career decisions love and that. it wasn't the right fit. Bingo. Because then they're like, oh shit, this person means business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would just, whenever people would ask me like, so your job history, what's with this? I would tell them I received better opportunities that really aligned with my mission and values elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I was honored to work on those projects. They wrapped. Now I'm looking for the next thing. Makes sense to me. Yeah. What is the smartest financial decision that you've made in your life? Ooh, that's a really good question. Isn't that a good one? Either personal or professional. <sighs> personal or professional. I have a few. I'll, I'll touch on them really quickly. The first was learning that you can, you can negotiate sign-on bonuses and using sign-on bonuses to pay down debt. Okay. Um, that's how I paid off my student loan. So that was kind of like a hack that I figured out that like if you started a new job and you ask for a sign-on bonus, like they give you like $5,000 cash right then and there and mm -hmm. you just put it on debt. Boom. That was helpful. Um, but also like I think quitting my job and doing this full time would be the smartest financial decision I've ever made. Yeah. And it wasn't like that to start. Like we weren't making, I wasn't making this amount of money until like mid last year. And yes. I started April, 2022. So we're almost two years old. So it took a while to like, actually make how much I make but yeah. now I make almost double my business made over a million dollars like mm -hmm. I if I hadn't quit my job and took the risk and gone those months hustling and you know yeah. being scared of like what did I do I don't have any money like yeah. we were we were really at the at the, the beginning you're probably yeah pretty broke <laughs> we were really broke like to the point where I was like we have like two more months to figure this out and then we can't pay the mortgage but that's what that's what people don't get is when you quit your job something ignites in you yeah and you just figure it out. Yep. Like you get it done when you, you don't have, have a paycheck coming in. It, it's so funny. I always tell people, if you hang out with me long enough, I'll convince you to quit your job. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I Same. have, <laughs> I have some friends who are like, cause my dad, my dad like raised us. He was like, never work for someone else. Love that. But, you know, you know, he, he doesn't like the word entrepreneur, but he, you know, he's like work for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a lot of friends who, you know, grew up in more traditional houses where they like don't understand like, wait, you don't have job security. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I have the ultimate job security. Mm -hmm. I can't get laid off. No yeah. one can fire me. That's such a good way to put it. Yeah. I'm, I, if I want more money, I go out and I make more money. Yeah. And it's the most liberating thing. That there's you, no cap either. There's no cap. If I was still working as a full freelance editor, mm -hmm. I would be making a quarter yeah. of what I'm making right now. Yeah. In, even in Same New York. Same hours. Oh yeah. Less, less like I work less. Yeah. I work less now. I get Literally. paid more to work less. Okay. Curious. I have, I have two questions really quick. So one, when you interview people, what have been like the salaries that are so high and you're like shocked? You're like, whoa, Ooh. I didn't know you could make that much in yeah. that role. Um, I mean, I think I had an idea that tech made a lot of money, like account managers, software engineers, that one didn't surprise me. Like yeah. whenever they tell me that they work in tech, I'm like, oh, this okay. is going to be a good salary. And if it's not like we might have to have a conversation off camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, but really like the people that do surprise me are the independent, like small business owners. Yeah. They are the ones that are making competitive salaries to everybody else. But when they're telling me like, this is how much I took home, I'm like, well, I know your business made more, you know, cause yeah. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. That really, hot dog vendor you interviewed. I love that guy. Blew my mind. Yeah. Such a nice guy too. And the water vendor outside the white house, like he made like seven K a month or something selling yeah. waters outside the white house. And people were like, that's yeah. BS. He has to be selling like a water, uh, a water every minute. And I'm like, have you been to the white house? He's selling summer? a water every minute. He's selling four <laughs> water bottles a minute, like, and another in four more in, in the summer in DC. Yeah. And they're on every corner. Yeah. It's, I'm so happy for them. DC has one of the largest pay gaps, actually the largest pay gap in the country between different races yeah really? african-american citizens there are drastically underpaid the irony they're not in these white collar jobs that are walking all around them on capitol hill and yeah. in the white house and you know anytime i can see them making money and uplift them i think that's a beautiful thing what is a lesson that you learned the hard way i think the number one would be not to to, to have a healthy level of distrust um I'm very much a 
good vibes you know mm-hmm. if I if I feel good vibes then that's all that you know I need mm-hmm. um people do want to take advantage if the opportunity presents itself and it's sad to tell people like you have to be scared of that but when you're on the other side of it and you are being taken yeah. advantage of it's like oh god I, I should have done a better job mm-hmm. you know asking questions learning who this person was feeling them out um yeah. so don't rush into important trust decisions trust but verify yeah. Nothing important needs to be incredibly rushed. Mm -hmm. What's meant to be will happen in due time. Mm -hmm. Take your time. Move slow. Don't rush. Yeah. Um, And then I guess also on like a more logistical standpoint (laughs) with agencies, 25% 25% is too much. Oh, if they are asking too much. for 20 to 25%, they're too much. asking for too much. The healthy level of an agent is like 10 to 15%. Talk yeah. to people. And that's the value of transparency is if you're not sure, reach out to the closest person you know that might be in a similar situation, similar role, yeah. and talk to them about Just it. Them. Just tell them this is what I'm going through. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Do you have any advice? Because yeah. if you keep it to yourself, that's where you make mistakes and you learn the hard way. Absolutely. Mentors are really important. You know, I have like six people that I'm always calling. Half of them are my siblings. And I'm like, what would you do in this situation? Um, And and people like you, I mean, we were just at VidCon together and we all stayed up so late one night. So late with with Sid. Sid And we were just like talking about like brand deals. And it just felt, it felt like we were like, you know, coworkers in a way. Literally. Um, Because entrepreneur you know, being self-employed is such a lonely job sometimes. It is, especially being a creator. Yeah. Because like, it is the wild west (laughs) there we are in the heyday of this economy and this industry and we're just learning as we go so the last part of the show is that i have viewers like you you can go to this link i'll put here somewhere um (laughs) and you write in a conundrum or just an issue that you're having and then i co-author advice with whoever my guest is okay let's see so okay so it says dear aaron antenna (laughs) I was promoted to an associate position at my workplace of eight years before going on my mat leave six months ago. However, I was told that it would come into effect on my return to work and that the particulars would be decided then. I love my workplace who... I love my workplace who have been exceptionally supportive through a sabbatical and two maternity leaves. They are very family friendly and I get on well with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. However, the pay is on the lower end of the scale, which is often the case for small private practices such as this one, rather than the large multidisciplinary companies. I'm keen to stay where I am, but I want to see a bigger jump in my salary than I suspect they're willing to give. Mm -hmm. In my favor, two associates have just left finding good talent in my field Oh, two associates have just left, and finding good talent in my field is notoriously difficult, so this may work in my favor. Yeah. Is it possible to stay where I am and negotiate my salary? This person writes weird. Is it possible to stay where I am and negotiate a salary that I'm happy with, or is the only way to boost my pay significantly... Oh, my gosh. Sorry, they write really weird. (laughs) Or is the only way to boost my pay significantly by jumping between jobs but losing the security of a family-friendly workplace? Help. Oh, goodness. Tale as old as time. <laughs> Sing it. <laughs> but, like, that is a real conundrum to be in, though. And I understand where they're coming from. Feeling, like, comfortable where you work. Having that work-life balance. Having especially support as a family supporting business is really hard to come by especially if they supported you through a sabbatical and two maternity leaves you can feel like oh this is like the gold pot I don't want to leave yeah other companies exist like that and like like they said having that skill set especially if it's in high demand yeah you need to advocate for yourself and recognize your worth Mm -hmm. them giving you maternity leave is not an amazing thing Mm -hmm. it should be the expectation it should be it should be normal that a company supports you through maternity maternity leave through a sabbatical that is not something that you should be like glorifying as this is the only company that does that other companies do it too Mm -hmm. and if they don't you have the skills that are in demand to negotiate that elsewhere like we said Pay is not the only thing that's negotiable. Yeah. You can negotiate that maternity leave. You can negotiate the benefits that you currently feel like you have 
at other companies. Mm -hmm. My advice and my experience is that you will get the highest pay bump by jumping companies. Yep. That is the best way to get like a 20,000, 30,000, even 50,000 raise. Absolutely. If you stay at your current company, my experience, like when I asked for the raise and I found yeah. out I was underpaid, they literally told me you had to be at the company a year before I even qualified for a raise oh and gosh. that they didn't give out raises of more than three to 5% at any one time. Oh and that gosh. is the standard for a lot of companies. If you're getting a raise, you're probably going to get about three to 5% on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. That is why job hopping outpaces the three to 5% because it's, if you job hop, you can drastically increase your salary overnight. Yeah. I would tell them, figure out what your values are. Is compensation something that you're struggling with? Mm -hmm. You know, that like maybe is not supporting your family the way it is. It, it used to be. Sounds like you just had a baby. Yeah. Money is important. Money yeah. pays the bills. Money helps you grow and live a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. Um, it's important. And so my advice would be to start interviewing. Yeah. You don't have to you don't Take have to accept the job anything. offer yet. Just yeah. see what the market's demanding. See what see the market's demanding. Take every interview because mm -hmm. it'll help you get comfortable with negotiating as well and getting comfortable with asking for what you deserve. So figure out how much other people are making. Start interviewing. See what's out there. And, you know, if they're not offering the, the work environment that mm -hmm. you really value, try to see if there's something you can negotiate or maybe, yeah. you know, Try to find mm -hmm. the perfect balance, but I would see what's out there. I totally agree. I completely agree. And I think this is something that our generation is changing that older generations maybe don't understand, you yeah. know, about the job hopping. It's companies are less loyal now. They they'll just lay you off and within an hour tech you have to be gone. Right now. Yeah, tech tech is going through and mar uh, advertising, marketing, other industries are being affected because of the tech domino effect. Mm -hmm. And they will lay off a perfectly wonderful employee same day. You're out of here. Yeah. And it's insane to me crazy um, that we even it's do unethical. that to people. I, I don't think it's right. I totally agree. Just sprinkle your resume out there. See what people want. Because I know that having this family-friendly environment like that, there's a dollar amount to that. Like going yeah. to work and feeling that's safe important. and cozy. So, so great to find that. And that's truly a wonderful thing just in your daily life, enjoying your, your work environment. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the only place where that exists. Exactly. The power of and. You might be able to have both. You can get the pay and have the work environment that yeah. you love. So I think a lot of people just have that scarcity mindset where it's like, I don't want to lose what mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. But you, you need to be willing to explore in yeah. order to get something better. Mm -hmm. It's like dating. Like, <laughs> yeah. you think you have the best boyfriend, and then you break up, and you're like, I'll never recover. And then mm, a month you later, do. you're head over heels again. But yeah. It's out there. You just have to find it. Okay, yeah, looking for a job is just like finding, like, a partner. <laughs> really? Honestly, though. Because, I mean, it takes up enough of your day. It better matter. <laughs> well, that was excellent advice. Thank you so much. Thanks. Where can people follow and support Hannah Williams? <sighs> Anywhere you consume your content, Salary Transparency is on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. <laughs> um, and I got all those platforms because my dad was like, I'm not getting a TikTok. I'm not getting an Instagram. Seriously. So I was like, okay, I have to be on all the platforms for you to watch our stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're on all channels. Um, if you want to check out our salary database, you can go to salarytransparency.com. Our job board should be up pretty soon. Yay! So that might may or may not be up when I make this announcement. Um, but yeah, if you also support pay transparency legislation, talk to your representatives. Mm -hmm. call them mm -hmm. tell them that this is something you support check what you know is actually happening in your state right now a lot of states have legislation in the works and they need to hear from you to hear that it's something you support as well in order to get it passed so use your voice advocate for yourself <laughs> all right well thank you so much hannah for being here today thank you erin it was so fun <laughs>